Good afternoon and welcome to the February 2012. Uh, meeting of the International Advisory Committee. We do have six members here. We do have a quorum. Uh, Craig, would that be Sir. Uh, let's see, I'll start with him. Mr. Morton. Glad to be here. Friend of transportation. Ms. Walsh. Here. Mr. Morris. Here. Mr. Hanson. Steady to be here. <laughs> Mr. Wilbur hopes to be here. Ms. Nile. Same kind of situation. Mr. Weaver. Here. Ms. Witt? Here. Uh, Ms. Watt is not here yet. Um, just uh, as an FYI, Ms. Stone King, who was our air quality rep for the TAC, is stepping down as the TAC rep. She's going to remain on the air quality committee, but Mr. Long will be taking over. But we haven't formalized that yet from the air quality committee. So. Ms. Morton, uh, Mr. Linden, will be uh, Thank you. We do have a quorum. Yes. Uh, would you like to go ahead and give us our public involvement? Sure. The AMATS meetings are all public meetings and the public is invited to come and testify, etc. If we have a business item, we'll have a presentation by staff or a consultant. The committee will then be given a chance to discuss it. And at that point, the public will be invited to come. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. And there might be some changes proposed. Yes. Motion to approve. Motion has a second and seconded by Ms. Walsh. So as you can see, we have business item 5A, which is strike through the TIP administrative modification. Those are some changes from the railroad. And since the railroad wasn't able to be here today, we ask that that be held over until next week. We have an informational item that we'd like to add as informational item 6B on the South Anchorage and Hillside intersection study. This was an AMATS funded project that the state did and uh, Kevin Jackson is here to present on that. And then if we could, when our consultant presents on item, uh, this would now be 6A, the CMP tech memo number, number three, if we could just add in the item down there, the informational item on CMP survey results, just do both of those at the same time. Okay. And you got all those? I think we do. And then also I believe the Item information item 6D was going to be plus one point two. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so what are we doing? Are we doing that? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So we have motion and second. Ask for approval as amended. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? Second. 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 Okay, I am 5A. Oh, yes, first. 5A. Oh, yes, thank you. Move to approve the minutes of December 4th. Second. Moved by Ms. Morris, seconded by Ms. Walsh. Um, all right, is there a discussion? Provided some suggested modifications. Pretty minor. Okay. Yeah, adding people to the list and name changes in there. Part of that. Minor technical and grammatical edits. So sure. Sure. Would you like to eliminate? Let me see him. Sad part is I gave her my mark that fancy. I think that to start out on the first page, there were two people missing from the attendance. One was Jim Amundsen, and one was Mr. King. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If I could, on page 13 of 15, the first paragraph that starts with Mr. Jacobson commented that he would like to reinforce. I believe that it was actually Mr. Amundsen. Fourth paragraph down it starts in response to Mr. Lindemood regarding whether DOT had reached a conclusion for what the highway to highway project is. Mr. Morton answered that DOT narrowed it down to two and a half options. This is where it changes a little bit. With the half likely to be eliminated by fiscal constraints. 
So give it up to her for clarity. got a revised table 3.1 and we'll go over those revisions in a um, PowerPoint presentation now to get the yeah and um, Dan Kushmer from Kingdom Systematics is here um, to go over those revisions with you. What we're asking for approval today is on the first two columns of the performance measures table and um, we appreciate the comments from uh, very Project manager Vivian Underwood, Aaron Young, and other um, team members of all of our um, So, Dan will provide an overview of the revisions and changes and what we're asking you to um, approve. Also, keep in mind that there'll be further uh, opportunity for comment and flexibility within this document. Another piece of our scope of work um, contained within the RFP is the data management plan. They do collection plan. So we're looking at what's the inventory of the data. Is it feasible for us to get the data? And as technology changes, so some of those pieces are included in this table. Also, to understand that that's another section. Um, I'll give it over to Dan now. Thank you. Do you want me to do the survey first? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank your committee for uh, having us here today. Um, the there's one item, informational item, that I've asked to do first. It was later on in the agenda, and that was to summarize uh, one of the online surveys that we did as part of the congestion management project. Uh, we we uh, got reached out to 76 stakeholders and got 25 to respond to this. So you have a copy of it. I won't go through a lot of it in detail. Uh, you know, we asked a general question of what improvements are most needed. Uh, address the congestion that exists here in the area and you can kind of see the types of things that fell out with intersection improvement strategies being by far the most mentioned of anything and then others other items related kind of generally in transit land use uh, the rest of the questions asked uh, kind of open-endedly about what, what would it take to uh, get more users of public transportation, uh, bike and ped facilities, uh, what type of information would be helpful uh, to, to commuters and users of the system, and what should funding be spent on. And I will say other than, uh, other than the um, information, which I think was kind of focused heavily on crashes, major incidents, things that were gonna cause major delays, that was the consensus there, as you might expect. Um, the other responses had a pretty wide range of, uh, of uh, answers and suggestions, and you will be incorporating these as we update the CMP. I won't go through them today, they're here for your information, and uh, um, in some cases, you're entertaining, so uh, read and enjoy. Any questions? <coughs> Yeah, I think, uh, as Teresa mentioned, we move on to uh, item three, the CMP performance measures. I think we introduced this at the last meeting, and sort of just three background items I want to put out there. We'll, we'll run through these pretty quickly and identify the changes from earlier versions of the memo, but uh, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to uh, identify a set of measures that relate to congestion, uh, that can be used for the congestion management plan update uh, that we're working on and also can be taken forward into the future to kind of test how these uh, projects are working uh, to relieve congestion in the, in, or address congestion in the area. So uh, a couple of background items. 
there are a number of items that uh, federal government has put out there, Federal Highway USDOT, as part of MAP 21. They haven't required any of them yet, uh, but they may do that. So we've identified those as part of this process. Uh, that that was part of the MAP 21 right? uh, re re MAP 21 legislation. Excuse me. Uh, other thing to mention is you know we've looked back and gone through a number of the old uh, status of the system and plan reports. Uh, we identified over 50 different measures that have been used within a fairly short period of time in those reports. And I think one of the goals here was to sort of narrow it down to a smaller set of meaningful measures that can be taken forward and can be sustained over time. So we look back at what's being used. Uh, some of the work we do will uh, we'll want to compare with what's happened in the past, but really more of a forward-looking exercise here to try to uh, concentrate on the set of measures that can be sustained. And finally, just to keep in mind that uh, a lot of the measures uh, that maybe were kind of tough to get in the past or weren't that reliable are going to be easier to get in the future because of technology that's out there and can be applied. So both the quality of the data is going to improve, the cost is going to go down of collecting it. So that was in our thinking that maybe something that didn't seem feasible in the past is something that people ought to be looking forward to. Uh, in, in the future. Um, as Teresa mentioned, you know, we have the performance measures, uh, the definition, you have the memo, and the key thing is tier one, tier two. Tier one, something we feel that's available right now, uh, ought to be a higher priority. Tier two is something we feel is a good measure, but may, it may take uh, some period of time to uh, get the data, process it, or before the data really becomes available and can support it in an effective way. So, you know, we're asking for uh, approval of both, but, and certainly if people have feelings that some of these ought to go one way or the other, that's fine too. Uh, but Teresa mentioned the data management plan. Those are the columns on the right. We've really started doing that. We had to look at uh, you know, questions of where you get the data and what data sources you might use in order to evaluate the measures. So uh, that work is going to be finished once we uh, get approval and go forward. So just quickly, vehicle hours of travel, vehicle miles of travel are both system measures of, of uh, total travel time and total mileage in the system. Uh, that they're out there, they've been used in reports in the past. Uh, travel time by quarter is another measure that's been used in the past, identifying some of the major quarters in the region. Uh, it's been done by travel time runs, people driving up and down the corridors. Uh, historically, there's some new sources of data that are emerging out there that uh, will provide more data, enable, uh, enable people to get information, and I'll mention two right here that are going to kind of run through some of these. One is Bluetooth uh, installations, which are being considered along some of the major quarters. That's a technology, a reader that pings cell phones and navigation systems uh, at different points along the corridor, kind of collects and processes the data in a big stew and can tell you kind of automatically what the travel times are along the corridor. Uh, there's a data set, uh, NPM RDS, that uh, Federal Highway has bought from a private vendor, a company that's owned by Nokia, and they're collecting this data right now on all the national highway system across the country. Uh, travel times every five minutes for, uh, um, for trucks and cars. It's pretty limited here in the Anchorage area right now, but uh, it is a source that's out there, and uh, they're not the only vendor. There are other people who supply it. So as we go through some of these uh, additional measures, you know, that, that's, that's going to figure in in the future as a way to get the data. So we have travel time by quarter, and we have travel time ratio, which is just a measure of what it takes to travel and experience uh, versus what it takes to travel in the middle of the day. And as you track that over time, you can see if peak congestion is 
it's getting worse. And you'll note that we changed the travel time corridor and added it into tier two to phase any um, collection data needs that maybe we don't have technology now, maybe in the future. Yeah. Um, these are some additional, two additional measures of travel time or annual vehicle hours of delay. That's where you can set a threshold. Um, can be a level of service threshold or free flow travel time and then calculate the additional uh, hours of delay that people are incurring beyond that. Uh, again, that's listed as a tier one. We also added a tier two saying today you can do it with travel time rugs or modeling. Uh, it'll be a lot more accurate in the future when you get these sort of constant sources of continuous sources of travel time data. And the 80th percentile index is a new measure that uh, is kind of emerging. It may be part of the MAP 21 requirements. And that looks at the, that again requires a lot of data, so it's a tier two, but it looks at the distribution of travel times and looks at the 80th percentile, which is kind of assumed to be not a congested condition, but not the worst condition uh, versus a free flow travel time. Kind of a sense of what people have to build into their trip if they, uh, in order to make sure they get somewhere on time. Uh, moving on into some of the safety measures, these are pretty standard uh, vehicle crashes by severity been used in the past. Um, and the more serious uh, incidents on the roadway per 100 million VMT. Uh, we've added two new ones since the original memo came out, uh, incident response time and incident clearance time. Uh, what you really want to know is kind of both together from the time the incident was reported, when did the road clear. Uh, but it's a little tougher to get the second part of that. Um, so, you know, we feel the first part is going to be ready, readily available at the time uh, from uh, the time between when a responder was dispatched and when uh, uh, they arrived at the scene. So we'd start with that and we'd hopefully be able to add the clearance time at some point. Uh, public transportation, some, uh, some pretty standard measures here, a couple of new ones. Uh, Overall transit ridership, uh, something that's been used before, readily available. Uh, we understand that on-time performance is available too. It kind of relates to congestion in two ways. If there's a lot of delay in the system, people are less likely to use it. And it also gives you some sort of proxy for what's going on traffic-wise on the transit routes, because if there are delays, there are a lot of times a result of uh, of, of traffic issues or incidents. Uh, one we, uh, one that's also been used in the past is looking at the public transit uh, automobile travel time ratio from sort of selected OD pairs, uh, trips, origins and destinations that a lot of people use. Kind of a sense of how well uh, public transit is, is serving those, those major trip patterns and uh, probably again more meaningful on express routes where that's kind of the intent is to compete with the, uh, with the automobile. And then we had the uh, discussion in the working session. Uh, the square footage measure is one to look at how much development is centered around uh, transit oriented development. Uh, we had a discussion and suggestion about the fact that looking at the population within a quarter mile of the system or looking at the percentage of the population served by transit that might be a more effective measure there. So uh, that's something we'll be, be taking, taking forward people may want to think about. Uh, On to the ride share, uh, one measure there, that's just the participation in the ride share and van pool program. Uh, we understand that's available and again that's meaningful to track over time to see how many people are taking advantage of these programs and teaming up for their trip. Pedestrian and bicycle elements. Um, the, the, first, the first one is uh, safety related and uh, while it may not be directly related to congestion, clearly the perception of, of safety in your route is, is a pretty big um, um, 
criteria for someone deciding whether to commute, <laughs> particularly on a regular basis. And again, that's something, a measure that's available. Pet bike data is obviously a little harder to get, a little more challenging to, uh, to measure. The connectivity index is kind of done different ways by different people, but the idea being if you had a desired system of connections for bicycle and pedestrian trips, um, what percentage of that system is missing? Uh, and that, again, is kind of a, a proxy of people's willingness to use the system if they can use a safe and maybe dedicated facility for their trip, they're more likely to use that mode. Uh, we had some additions that were made uh, to the uh, to the list since the original memo, and those are measuring the number of bicycle trips and the number of pedestrian trips. This would probably focus on commuting trips as opposed to just recreational or, or other trips. Uh, it's a little bit tough to get. It's asked in the travel survey, and uh, the other way you can look, kind of look at this is getting counts at various places to see uh, how that changes over time. And just as a reminder on the connectivity index for bike and head, in our 2035 MTP, an action item is to develop a multimodal level of service. So that might help us reach that goal. And then the final category involves goods movement. Uh, again, this is a big focus of MAP 21 and Federal Highway to look at the uh, look at freight movement on the system. So uh, a new measure that's recommended here are annual hours of truck delay. Uh, this would probably be done by highlighting some of the major truck routes, probably a limited number, and the data you collect for some of the earlier traffic measures would kind of serve you here as long as you had some classification counts to apply it to. Uh, truck reliability index is, uh, again, similar to the travel time index I showed earlier, uh, kind of how much extra time is uh, incurred for a truck to make its destination. And as I mentioned, you can put a value to this because, you know, certainly in this sector, time is uh, time is money, and that's probably uh, a meaningful measure if you're, you know, comfortable putting a value to the to the cargo that's out there. And finally, then this is a fairly simple measure, just looking at some key locations that are important to freight movement in the region and uh, tracking the truck volume over time. It was brought up in the work session, um, Sharon Walsh mentioned, you know, on ship days, you may have to look in the data collection management piece. When would that be a good time to collect that data and how should we do it? So um, do keep in mind that the data management um, plan will probably flesh out some of those types of questions and coordination efforts. Um, on the transit measures, um, transit ridership in our community is, is in a lot of ways directly tied to the budgets for the transit. Is there a way to normalize it so that the budget, because you know, we've seen cuts in service um, because of budget cuts, and that affects transit ridership. So unless you have some way to capture that for the new year, um, you're, if you're looking at um, the ridership from year to year on transit, it, it's going to be hard to compare it if what you're seeing from here is also a budget change. You can run it uh, per vehicle hour, vehicle mile of service. So that that's a good comment. That was to say. If, you, if the level of service out there has been changing a lot, then you probably want to peg it to either vehicle hours or vehicle miles, which is pretty easy. Yeah. And that, that would kind of account for that. I mean, you can also do it for dollars spent, but I'm not sure that's as meaningful as what the customer sees is the amount of service out on the street. So yeah, th there's also the yeah, there's also an important there. You know, we have a lot of the community that, that wants to see more transit, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they're not out there advocating when the budgets are getting cut. But it, you know, it's kind of helpful to show both <coughs> measures, um, you know, in discussing. Yeah, that's good.
so this is back to the committee. And uh, just for clarification, the TAC is the announcement to do exactly what we do. Just for public review, is it on the policy committee for release or just acceptance of the technical memo and moving forward? Right, moving forward, um, approval of the technical memorandum so that we can work with the next. And of course, there'll be more opportunity for comment on the fully, um, the, the full document. So um, we've had some comments brought forward from, I believe, the traffic and signal section recently from DOT. And so we incorporated some of those um, thoughts within this revision recently. And so we fully anticipate that that may be some additional comments that folks have. And then, of course, once you get to the data management section, you may want to revisit some of these performance measures and go, uh, is this realistic? So. I would say a tentative approval so that we can move forward with the next session. Okay, do we have a motion from the committee? It's not 
Yes. It's this discussion on the price, and then probably make a, a motion to amend. But I thought that there were several times we talked about um, membership, the lack of better term, recruitment, that we were going to lay out how membership, when we have to go out, there would be a posting on the web page, there would be announcements or such and such. Um, I think that needs to be laid out because that there was a comment about that on the policy committee when they were asking how would we go about finding these people. And I think, I really think it needs to be laid out for them. You've talked about how you've done other things, but for this particular committee, I think it's very important that a process is laid out that's very clear. We want to have that same information in the, all the other committees because we do the same kind of recruitment for all of them. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, right now. This well, I'm just saying we, we have done that recruitment for all the other committees and have never had a question or a comment on the new level. And so we have a process that's in place that we use. Yes, it is not delineated in any bylaws. Um, well, there's a difference between the other two. Very specific, specialized committees that are going after, you know, bike, freight, air. Okay, this is general, and this has a lot more weight than any other committee that we have. This is the main, this is the only air, this is the advisory committee. And I think that um, it would behoove us to lay out how we would be. Just mine two cents. Uh, my first thought on this, I'm not so sure that it should be in bylaws. But I agree with you, and I think that it should be a written process that we have that specifically says <coughs> how we recruit police. And maybe there's, you know, and maybe there's three, you know, the different committees have different processes, different places that we go to, but I, it seems to me that that should be in, in the policy okay. procedure that we have here. That doesn't sound to me. It's not something I've seen normally in bylaws. So, just a comment. I agree. So I, I guess then I would request that somebody write down the, you know, process. come up with the process for our review and approval. No, I, 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 I agree it makes a lot more sense than the policy procedures, that's just my opinion, but um, it seems like bylaws is a lot more, you know, a structure of the committee and what its purposes are, not Just in the interest of actually approving this and maybe moving forward with it, uh, I, I, I don't know that it should be tied together with the approval of this. In other words, I don't want to hold it up for the for writing of this for another month, but that's certainly on the committee. Um, I mean, we have a process that we utilize. I'd be happy to write up policy and procedure number, I think we're up to seven now, um, and uh, have it ready, but it's up to you if you want to bring it back next sure. month again. Epic. 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 I mean, you did explain to us in general how you go about that. It doesn't seem like it would take that much time to put that together. No, it, it, it won't. I just, I was hoping to move this I, up. But I think we could move this forward, but that okay. should go along with it. I would agree that I think we should move this forward and then with the understanding that you're going to come back. Yeah. The policy procedure that it specifies. Yeah. Well, the any kind of policy is going to go have to have a public comment with this. <coughs> so I think I would be fine with them drafting a policy and present it to the to the director of the policy committee. We can send an email around to everybody and just show us before it goes and get comments. But I think it would be given to the policy. I mean, a draft with this at their next meeting. Yeah, I guess my thought is we we can 
we can have a process in place that we use and when we already do, the policy and procedure would just formalize it. You can right. still say, we can pass this today and in the next month we can start creating this committee. That policy and procedure would just formalize it. We can already have the process. And I can start writing this up after the meeting or tomorrow. I just don't want to, I was hoping to get it moving forward. <laughs> this identical okay. language. Um, I did, Aaron and I discussed this earlier today about how we, <coughs> the policy committee has made it very clear, they want everything, everything to go through there, which is, uh, I can't remember where the language is, but we added it to all the committees. Um, we just don't, we don't have it specifically there. Uh, that, that, that was made very clear that everything goes through the TAC. And then another, just <coughs> on page three or four under quorum and attendance. So the majority of the authorized members of the committee shall be formed for the transaction of business. Should there be six or more members since it's 11? Did you print that off the? Uh, it's a high. The, uh, the one I passed out is six. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I did. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So, if there's no other discussion of the committee, we can open up to the audience if there's any questions or comments. <clears throat> oh. And Brooks, I had I had two comments. Um, one related to the uh, quarterly meetings. I think it might be good to name the months that you want those meetings. Um, just because of some some date certain for public and for planning purposes. If you're like a person like me. Um, planning on, on presenting some to that and then uh, uh, section 3.2.3.6 um, I think one week is not enough time to advertise prior to the meetings I think it needs to be two I think can't if you're going to get meaningful participation I think you need another week on notice thank you other comments from yeah. comment about the one week time I don't know that, it, that this can't have independent rules, but I know several public meetings that I've had to check that we notice them in time. The, the, if you talk to the municipal attorney's office, they say a week is considered a reasonable amount of time. Seven days. They've always come back. Yeah. So I don't know if we make another committee have a higher standard or not. Well, I guess, not that I'm a committee member, but for my two cents, considering the weight that we're putting on this particular committee um, and the fact that they only meet quarterly, two weeks is probably a good idea. One week for the business items to be posted at least, but two weeks <coughs> notice is good. I mean, again, it's a quarterly meeting. And they're volunteers. So they're not happy that often, so I, I think it makes sense that we stretch it a little bit for this one. Okay. We certainly you know that we So we have before us um, the, any other questions, comments? Okay, we have before us the draft bylaws of the Indian Citizen Advisory Committee. And we've had some discussion and some suggestions. And so at this point, I need to a motion to get it on the floor. Move to approve to, I move to recommend to the policy <laughs> so, Ms. Hyle recommends that it be recommended to the policy committee to release. Is that the process? Yeah. To the policy now, not public? Okay. Well, in, in, in years past, we have had the technical committee <coughs> release.
these things previously, but I'd say the last it's four or five years, it's been the policy. And debate. it's sensitive enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was moved by Ms. Heil and seconded by Mr. Hansen. So the suggestions that we just heard, you would, how do you put those forward to the policy committee? Okay, so you're saying we would approve the suggestions or not, rather you put them forward? We're, we're going to do that right now. Shall we just uh, identify them all and then approve them all at the same time? There you go. Okay, so how are to do it? Move to amend 6.3.6 for at least two weeks prior to the scheduled meeting day advertise, but keep the one week prior to more supplemental material and to add in the lens for the quarterly meeting. Are you open for discussion or are you well, it's to the to committee, committee but we'll make the sorry I just have you know um, just a quick comment so so with two weeks notice and one week on an agenda I'll be advertising a meeting two weeks ahead of time without knowing what necessarily is on the agenda should those be current just looking for some guidance or some clarification So we'll have the agenda clear enough two weeks prior to know, and then support documents will come a week later. If they don't come at the same time, they're just giving it a little bit more. Just looking for some clarification. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and, and just just to make sure everyone understands that these are quarterly meetings. If we need other meetings, those will also be called, and we'll have the same two weeks notice we prior to accept. So if we're working on the MVP and we're trying to get something done. We already had a meeting in January, <coughs> we can have other meetings so we can get things done, but they still have that two week. So your quarter could technically start at any month and you do that in two weeks. So how does the committee want to do this? Do you want to specify months or let staff identify months or go with the year of the quarter? Or anything, so. oh. I'll, I'll second gotcha. These two changes? Yeah. Okay. I guess I'm not in favor of putting specific months. I think, I think it's just too flexible. I think it's, especially if we provide two weeks notice, I think that's um, adequate. I mean, they, they may end up meeting six times a year. If they feel necessary, I and mean, it should be up to the committee. Right? They feel I mean, to meet more often. And I think if there's two weeks notice, I think that that's, uh, that's reasonable. the change from uh, one to, to refer to a two weeks prior to the scheduled meeting date in text. Any objection? Okay, that's approved. Now it goes back to item 2.3.1, which was uh, to specify months for quarterly meetings so that it's understood when those quarters would start. And that was one that there's been discussion on this. So let's go to the page, shall we? It's taken half a year at this point. It would be nice to have a little bit of flexibility in the system. There are 11 members. Six are needed for a quorum. I have to believe there's provisions for backup if the, the primary member is not able to attend. Like staff to be able to set the dates. So I will draw that second, the second edit. Does that make it easy? Okay, 
Okay, so um, the second motion, or the, the motion to approve the specificity of the months has been withdrawn yeah. and seconded. Okay. Second degree. Okay. Second degree. Anything else? Like now, back to the main motion. Uh, so approved as amended. Any objections? Ready to Perfect. Now we get to the operating agreement. Okay, so this is. So this is changing the name of AFCS from Solutions to System, <laughs> and then also to create a Citizens Advisory Committee, like uh, just in the bylaws, uh, 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 standalone AFCS. Okay, is what before us is what before us changed from what was posted because there's some corrections that need to be made to the technical uh, There were a few changes, uh, especially the part about it being 11 members instead of 9 members. You got that one, okay. That one. And that is not at large? Okay. Yeah, I got rid of that one. And did you change? Sentence there after the, the next paragraph, paragraph, paragraph. paragraph. Next story that says AMATS proposals and for another sentence that says AMATS is very unique and that there's only one local government unit inside the boundaries of the HBO. Yeah. And that this would, and that's, I mean, to me, that's kind of why Expand we would um, really recommend that, that we have a system that the advisory committee because we're, we're a single I government. Agree. Okay, so there's basically two items. One is to change the name, and the other is to recognize uh, the formation of the Citizen Advisory Committee existing as an 11 member body. And then to add, should we add it? Okay, is there a motion? Oh, oh sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Are there comments, uh, questions from the audience? Mr. Katzian. Gary Katzian. Uh, just one quick one. You were changing the name. Do you also change the logo? That hasn't come <laughs> forward to us. The, uh, Which includes the letterhead and everything. Right. The, the, uh, the logo change, the letterhead, et cetera, et cetera, is part of the public involvement plan update. And so that's something that this committee would, and the public would have an opportunity to uh, deal with, <coughs> or comment on, etc. When we bring that through hopefully next month, so we obviously can't change the name until the operating agreement is changed. So once we do that, then we can start the process of changing whatever other things we want to do. Yeah, I mean, this, this committee may decide. You guys create a logo, do whatever you want. So the, the logo would be proposed as part of the is that correct? Well there there is a proposed new logo in the draft PPP, which okay, we haven't so we're released not yet. To, so we're not this has to nothing to do with that right now. I mean again just name this, change and the committee. Yes, the, this committee could say, you guys go forth and make a nice logo and we'll be happy with that, or they may yeah, well, let's just wait till the fall. Yeah, so this right now is just the name change in the and the CAC. Okay. Um, anything else? Um, follow on question, I guess, on that. Is that the change in the logo or housekeeping measure? What is the name change? Is that really something that needs its own life? I would think that's a very, at least 
a member of the policy committee that would probably want to wait. There are probably several that don't. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, for approval, subject to the plan, amendment suggested by this file, and staff correct the language to insert. The plan. Second. Is that Ms. Weaver, second by Ms. Pyle. Is there any um, objection? Yeah. Uh, so I just personally like solutions better than the uh, system. I think it kind of says what we're doing, you know, rather than what it is. Oh, why, now you bring it up. <laughs> well, now's the appropriate time. This is my personal view. I, I prefer solutions. I think it's better. I kind of do, too. First, it's better. I can tell you from my experience, when I try to explain to people why we're using solutions, they're always like, eh? But system, I mean, if you think nationwide, you're talking about a transportation system which consists of the road network system, the trail network system, the transit system. So it, most people, most non-technical folks connect with this committee or the policy committee, they hear system and they go, oh, I get it, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And solutions are always like, is it a solution? Is it a solution? So, Did we, what was our S before? It was study. study. <laughs> Which, <laughs> that's, that's kind of, was the standard for a lot of MPOs around the country. But the other AMAT's Akron is system. Akron Metropolitan Transportation System. I have not seen any other solutions. Stop pushing. I thought everybody says system. Yeah. Everything we had was solving problems. Yeah. Do we have a motion on the second on the floor? Should we break them apart? Could you repeat the motion, please? This it was to approve the memo with the modification uh, offered by Ms. File for <coughs> adding about the uniqueness of the emails. Let's break them apart, please. Okay. Um, so do we have to have people who nominated? Do we have to break it apart through the people who made the motion? Okay, I, I move that we change the memo to retain the existing EMS uh, solution rather than system. I thought we were That's not right? No, no, no. Yes, that's correct. That's an additional amendment that you have to the other stuff. The whole thing. Yeah. So he's making an amendment to, mm -hmm. to the original yeah. motion. Yeah. 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 Correct. Yeah. 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 It's correct. correct. Yeah. Okay. But okay. the amendment needs a second. Yeah. 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 The amendment does need a second. Uh, okay. Or it could and die. Yeah. I'll, I'll second. second it for. Oh, can I second it? I'll second it. You can't. I'll second it for yeah, Skip. Say, you. Okay. So, uh, discussion. Solutions versus. I, I tend to think systems is more intuitive. I mean, I'm not I'm going to. <laughs> Solutions. Change for the sake of change serves no purpose. I, I don't see the significance of the difference. I like the letterhead. Motion to approve. As I said to Mr. Morris, personally, I don't care. <laughs> Either one worked for me. I can see both, so I don't know. I really don't care. I'm always ready to abstain from But I think I need to vote, oh, don't I? Yeah. Okay, Damn. Kyle. Do you have any for yourself? I'm so excited already. Okay, so shall we do this by a voice vote? Oh, yeah. You're going to be. What is out there 
what is before us right now is to accept this memo with the exception of changing the AMAS name to keep the name at Solutions, correct? That's what your motion was, to accept this memo? With the modification to change it to Solutions. To keep it at Solutions. Okay, Mr. Morton. So an A vote keeps it at Solutions, right? And adds her paragraph. Yes. Yes, concur. Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> Jennifer. Jennifer. <laughs> um, I will vote yes. So that means that Steve's proposal passes. <laughs> okay. Moving right along. Um, so now we are down to the VPAC letter. Is that right? Uh, and I understand the, okay, how, we also have Mr. Scott Thomas here, our Excuse safety me. engineer to us. Did we do that correctly? There was an amendment. The amendment, did it fail or pass? It, it passed. It's the that's what I was going to say. We need to vote on the main motion. I thought they had modified it to, vote, to, to do both. To do both. I, I think we'd have to do the full. Okay, so we have to go back to the main motion, which is to approve the memo with, with the edit. Approve the memo with the two edits. Two edits, right. The original amendment to go to the to stay with. Solutions and the additional language that they have to do. Okay, because we amended. Okay. So if we just vote yes on this, it just all goes. I don't understand the difference. But anyway, so we just have to do what I just did again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first time when I was just study solutions, that's it. Oh, so now we have to do it both together. Together Got with it. the whole thing. Anybody object to doing just that? To now let me change it? <laughs> Any objection to the main motion? To accept the changes here and keep solution. No objection. It passes. Is that okay now? Thank you. Okay. Um, NACTO. Okay, so we had this as an information item last month. There's some discussion about using this NACTO guide as one of the tools in the toolbox. This is a letter from the AMF Flight and Head Committee to Recommend that recommended the AMATS policy committee that the NACTO guide, which is National Association of City Transportation Officials, that the NACTO urban bikeway design guide be integrated in the AMATS road project design, serve as an additional tool for designing urban streets within the AMATS area. That's the that's the letter that's coming from BPAC, and they're asking the, this committee to recommend approval of this letter up to the policy committee. Um, I have also included. This document that uh, is, is a draft document here, you can tell that there are 28 samples of the word draft, uh, which is uh, from Mr. Morton, to all project managers related to bicycle dining design resources, and includes the language down there at the bottom, urban bikeway design guide, NACTO, which shows that it's a guide as opposed to a standard. So I, mean, I, I would imagine you'd like to comment on that, but those two items are there for your information so that you can decide if you want to recommend approval of this to the policy committee so that they would make it as their official policy of evidence. Okay, open to the committee for discussion. Okay, Mr. Morton. If I may. <coughs> um, please do. The, I think the intent of the EPEC memo can be met through this draft. <coughs> a bit of a this memo here that's in front of us uh, from my pen for my signature, which indicates that we will recognize, do recognize the NACTO second edition 2014 as a guide for urban bikeway design. I think that meets the intent of what the committee was after. 
do have some concerns about the structure of the committee's memo. My goal is to acknowledge NECRO through this process here and let this, let this serve that function and uh, not do that. the other letter, the on business item to the policy. Thank you. Other comments of the committee before we open it up for discussion? Mr. Hanson. The only comment I had, and I'm reading the letter again, and all it says is that integrated payments, blah, 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 as an additional tool, it doesn't specify standard or guide. I mean, you know, I don't see anything. I, I can support sending it down as a guide to be included as guide. Here, let me yeah. respond on the last paragraph on page three. It recommends that the guide integrated into Union's road project design and to serve as an additional tool when designing urban streets within the Amance area. I really don't know what that means. Well, uh, that's why I say that. I mean, I send it down. And you Send a recommendation that it is in the guide with attaching your number. Is that okay. a problem? Two. I mean, it doesn't specify that it is a standard. That would be. That would be. So what you're saying is make sure that any the, the recommendation that <coughs> attached with it. Yeah, recommendation would be, okay, we can send it down to the policy committee <coughs> with our recommendation that it is a guide to be used and attach Ken's direction to the uh, project managers uh, that it is a guide. Now, there may be questions come up, what's the difference between the standard and the guide? And I'd also like to let this go a little bit longer to get people's comments back. Sure. Okay. Let's see. At this point, we'll open up the audience and hear questions or comments. Mr. Thomas. Um, Scott Thomas, DOT Traffic. If there are questions on standards versus guides, uh, I could help with that. Uh, a lot of what our standards are uh, passed by laws, state laws or federal laws, that, uh, such as the MUTCD, and they're full of uh, features that we have to do for uniformity. Whereas a lot of guides, such as NACTO, are bringing in new ideas, useful ideas, but maybe they're still under experimentation or interim approval, and they, they maybe haven't been adopted as, as a uh, uniform practice everywhere yet. But, it helps us to have the new ideas on the show. Okay, other comments from the audience? I'm bring them back to the committee. I, I do, um, my, my comment here is having seen the uh, joint memo that was signed by Stephanie Romillo and Scott that was originally, uh, you know, there's no reference and it only is, is putting out DOT and I'm not sure that this is really a, a factual representation of what happened. And so maybe uh, some of that could be discussed. And that is my problem with this memo and already, you know, we can certainly provide this information and, and just let them know that the DDOT is already, you know, in the process of talking with the guy. But I think it just, it, I find it a little uh, confusing and misleading about the way the information is presented. But that's my, my take on it. Uh, other comments, Mr. Martin? Or do we need to put it on the on the table first, or slap that up first? Talk. Talk. Okay. We're good at that. I do not favor advancing. It, maybe I misunderstood Jerry's comment. I do not favor advancing this to the policy. But if something like this was advanced to the policy committee as an informational item, recognition that this is what we're doing, I, I think that that serves the purpose. 
that step to put something together as well? There was a, are there yeah. copies of that here? Um, Stephanie and Scott have prepared something that's referenced here. To know the um, precursor to uh, using this as a guide is just that we uh, um, work together as technical staff to document um, where we're at as a city in terms of uh, safety concerns and uh, operations and maintenance concerns. Uh, our job, I think, is to follow the AMAT spike plan as best we can and. Uh, and our design standards. And the EMS bike plan said, uh, and, and references a lot of documents, it says the AASHTO is our primary standard, and uh, it says we should do things at traffic signals. Should is a, the equivalent of a <coughs> recommendation in some state laws that point to these manuals recommendations. The kind of thing we have to take is almost a standard. And, uh, so words recommend, require, should mean a lot. And, and as we compare all of these sources, we have to, our, the way we saw it was we have, to, we have to do it all right. We have to do it right or not partial. So what we documented in a memo that, that you had at the previous meeting was we're having trouble putting together the entire bike plan at traffic signals without causing some safety risks. The, and we're having trouble dealing with some of our older interchanges with High volume right turns, high higher radius ramps. So we do seek these other guides because they they give us like in 2014 new ideas on what to do at ramps from ITE or NACTO as well as AASHTO and the bike plan all say that we should use signal detection as signals so that bicyclists are, are recognized and uh, the, the computer serves them, they know what to do rather than break the law. So what that memo illustrates is, is that we're, we're, at a, we're at a sticking point locally, not, not against other cities. They've solved it, <coughs> but locally the AMAT spike plan says we should have some signal features, but we also should solve the maintenance and operations funding and resources to make that work. We take some safety risks if we don't do that. So, so we're kind of saying we're stuck right now. We can't add these signal features uh, in, in an individual design. We've got a major program, program decision. And maybe some of the other features like that we see in NACTO are bigger than the budgets that are set aside in the events bike plan for, for adding features. So we're doing what we can with what we have. And that's that's what this memo is outlined. Or out, outlined. And, uh, two major safety features were in there that are, that are causing trouble. Signals, unresolved, and uh, higher speed, higher radius ramps. Everybody agrees is a, is a conflict area. So I, I think that what you get from that meeting log is just a status report from the staff saying, here's, here's a couple areas we can't solve without additional resources. They, they remain a safety problem. And we'll, the rest of the system work trying to assist plans in putting those features. And then uh, the memo is, if I might clarify too, then the memo that um, Ken has shown you today is that we've got some standards required by law and, and we try to comply with those. They're full of mandates. And then we've got several guides and NACTO adds to our list with uh, it's something we've had on the shelf with the rest of our highway design section, even, even prior to this memo. So in effect, what you're saying, Scott, is that it is already a tool that DOT has. Yes. And I assume the municipality as well, that they are already referring to in use of the <laughs> Yes, it's a guide and a tool, and it has some of the latest ideas. Some of them, the federal highway is still recognized as interim and experimental and not system-wide. Okay, what is the... I'm just curious, can you know, I just look through here, I mean, the guide is at least referenced over a dozen times. Is there, is there language in here that you find problems? 
There is there is light that you have. I saw one of the search in that case. C the projects will be utilize ASH2 and MUTCD guidelines. In general, both of those are for standards. The MUTCD is is not a guideline. That's the nature of the concerns. It's understood that it is to be used as a guide. But certainly there's no issue with that whatsoever. Yes. Well, just uh, also the underlying sections on page two, being counter to what it is that occurred, is that the BAP's decision to not consider the options to not provide will result in options being left on the table, and that doesn't seem at all consistent with what we've just heard. Well, the guide is is a guide of what's possible, and uh, but um, each. When you're talking to what can we do in design, you also have to remember that a design is constrained by its um, scope, schedule, and budget. And there was a lot of the designs that are coming out were set from line items in the bike plan and set up with budgets, and you only do a certain amount that way. But what I was speaking to a minute ago is we're actually stuck on um, solving some really complex <coughs> problems at signals. Unless we solve them 100%, we haven't accepted solving them partially. They need signal detection. They know how to do that in the rest of the country. I'm, I guess I'm unfamiliar with the mechanism between the bike and ped committee and this committee. I've seen this on paper. I don't know when the bike and ped committee met, talked about it, you know, if they had opportunity to talk with the OT people. And if, if they had that opportunity, something could, you know, this was sent back to them saying, oh, here's what's going, you know, here's the concerns that they could put something forward. I, I feel like we're just respecting the, the bike and ped committee just to dismiss it out of hands they were not sending it forward. I'd be more comfortable if there was a bike and ped committee where some DOT people were talking forward. I was actually at the bike and ped committee, and so was Scott and Jim Emmons, and what this memo was developed from is that meeting log that Scott was referencing where they're talking about we can't do these things fully so here are our options until we can get to that point to be able to be at 100 percent and so the bike ped committee felt that DOT was not looking at NACTO because of that they, they were kind of misunderstanding what we were saying on that point um, that we use NACTO as a guide not as a standard to require ourselves to do it and so that's where this memo kind of comes in is there might have been a misunderstanding between that meeting log and what the BPAC feels should be done. So, so is it worth sending back? It so do, do, are they, they intend to, or they want this put in as a standard? They, is that what you, I heard you say, is that? So it's really hard to understand what the BPAC wants. <laughs> I, I, I understand. Somebody here from the BPAC that can speak to this? I know. This, this, it is, this, my, this. my understanding, from the discussion there was they, they wanted it to be used as a guide, as one of the tools in the toolkit to do that. And I think Aaron's right, there was some, there's definitely some misunderstanding from, that came out of that, of what they thought was actually occurring. And so, I, mean, I think you could, you could edit this memo to take out portions of it and then just make sure it's clear about asking to, you know, we have standards and this would be used as a guide. You're already doing it, so what's what would be the, I think their thought would be, if you're already using it, what would be the harm of passing this? As long as you clarify which ones are standards and which ones are guides. But, but just wait. I mean, you, if, if this was written by, by the bike and they have to edit. Yes. We can well, write a disclaimer on it and yes. put some other things on it. We can say, here's the informational, this is their work product, there seems to be some issues. The TAC is sending it back, and and, and that information goes to the policy committee just to give them a feeling of what's happening. But the reality is that you can't change their product. I guess what I was suggesting is we offer them edits, send it back to the BPAC, and then say, here are our suggestions if you would like this to go forward, because it has to come to the TAC before it gets to the policy committee. I wonder if we could uh, just bring that Ken's memo to the Biden committee and ask them if this satisfies their concerns. 
Yeah, that may solve it. Go all the way to the policy. That may solve it. Okay. Right there. Okay, would somebody like to put the... I may still. I would like to get comments on this. I've sent it up to the other two regions at the DOT. I've sent it up to the headquarters. I'm hoping that somebody here has a connection to BPAC and can share it with them as well. Can right. we do that? This solution was, the would say, we received your memo. We want you to look at this formally. Because we and get formal comments to us because uh, we think this will satisfy this and get their feedback formally. I mean, they submitted this with us, and we <coughs> submit something back, and go from there. Okay, would somebody like to put that in the form of a motion? Uh, is there a motion on the floor already? No, no, no. Okay. You never, you never no, I don't know. Is, is that we need a motion? Just, just for informational uh, purposes, the BPAC is meeting on March 4th, so the chair of the the quick link there. Okay. I'd, I'd like to move that, that, that DOT or DOT representative bring Ken Morton's draft memo forward to the BPAC committee on March 4th see what this satisfies their concerns. And then we can move forward. Yeah. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any objections? Okay, it is passed. Uh, um, I was an objection. Sorry. I was just going to. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Gonna, um, but we still haven't taken. Do we, do we need to formally say holding this in abeyance or uh, a revised version like. may come forward or something like that? I think uh, Can I? Should I? Then we shall table this memo. I might want to take a comment here. So I just want to bring up really quick that that only addresses the DOT side of what they were commenting yeah, on. There's the, the AMAT side of MOA portion that they are also. So I'm just bringing this up that if we bring it back to the BPAC, they're still going to be like, that's fine for DOT, but what about the MOA? So that, that's all I'm just bringing up. Yeah, Mr. Hanson, what about the MOA? <laughs> There's so much more than you guys do. It's not even funny. <laughs> okay, so this is the memo is tabled, and there will be further discussion. And it could be as yet an opportunity to share information. There still may be some um, dissatisfaction if, if DOT in particular is unable to implement some of the NACTO guidelines as part of our project. So that is, I think it's just uh, making it clear that DOT does have it as a tool. We are looking at it and see what. Okay, so we still have a motion. I didn't have time to say my comment before. Oh, you're fine. You did have. So I was going to offer an amendment to the motion that the MOA representative also accompany the OT. You just had Lori for that. Um, so is, the, is that accepted as a yes, friendly amendment, amendment by Mr. Morris and the second by Ms. Pyle to send both the OT and the municipal staff to the next week meeting in March? Any objections? Absolutely. Uh, noted. <laughs> so noted by Mr. Hansen. No, do you really? No, no. Does the motion pass then unanimously? Yes, it does. Thank you. We will send some. Okay, we have a PCAC and an air quality department. Recognizing we still have four units and a whole bunch of information. Yes, so for the BPAC, um, this double checking, we don't have any reappointments, but we do have one uh, social services organization seat on the BPAC. And uh, the suggested <coughs> new appointment is Zach Fields, who is a board member of the Anchorage Youth Court, and um, that is a social services organization. Uh, I think that is not a social services organization, but uh, the staff kind of thought, since the youth court is not a quarterly kind of board, but they meet quite often, it might fit the bill. I will remind the committee that we have been trying to fill this seat for over a year, and have, it's been challenging to find someone to fill this seat. So we're we're making this recommendation to you, and uh, be happy to hear details. I know Mr. Fields is here, so if you have any questions of him. Here's the first student. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you for enjoying this. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. I move to pass on her recommendation to the policy committee. Moved by Ms. Files, seconded by Mr. Hansen. Oh, comments from the audience. Sorry. Comments from the audience about this. I'm so sorry. Cindy's on the 
Jacobson, as Vivian said, and Carson Springer Hoff. It's good to see you all, all again. Uh, I won't take up an awful lot of time. I, I know your, your schedule is tight, but uh, we wanted to give at least a brief status report on where this project is. Uh, again, I wanted to point out that the project team, I think uh, Vivian has already talked about it pretty well, so I won't belabor this slide. The objective is just to remind you is really to update the existing ITS architecture, make sure that we follow the, the processes and procedures that are, that are appropriate to that, to coordinate with the congestion management process update. Uh, there's a public involvement plan. We actually called it a uh, 
stakeholder participation plan uh, that, that has been produced. And uh, one of the last things we'll do on this project after completing the architecture update is to have a workshop about a regional, perhaps statewide, also traffic operations center, just to get an idea of what people's thoughts and needs are in that. So where we are right now is we have uh, a draft uh, architecture update completed. There is a, uh, that draft is out for review. And uh, yesterday we held a use and maintenance workshop to go over how the uh, architecture is structured uh, and then how one might use it. I'll, I'll go over that in a little bit more depth. And uh, uh, our next step is to complete the, the update documentation, to uh, uh, complete the use and maintenance guide, and, and then, as we mentioned, to do the uh, workshop on the traffic operation or transportation operations. So the architecture itself is based on the national ITS architecture. That's a requirement from both FTA and FHWA. But it is tailored to Anchorage. Uh, we've combined some of the national architecture kind of, uh, what's a good way to, to call it? Some of the, some of the things that, that they put out to say how you uh, provide a service were very small, kind of more granular. Uh, harder than to kind of comprehend in my view. So we've combined some of those into bigger entities that are a little bit easier to visualize. So one is on transit operations, for example. So it covers all of transit instead of about a dozen different service packages that would have, that would have covered transit uh, if we weren't strictly based on the service packages from the uh, national ITS architecture. Uh, we also, in the original architecture, there were six main documents and several other kind of uh, affiliated documents, if you will. And we've combined that all into one document, simplified it, make it, make it easier for people uh, to find things. We're hoping that this will also mean that more people will actually look at it who need to look at it, project managers and, and some things like that. Finally, it's being developed in a structured database software program called Turbo Architecture that will make it easier to update and edit in the future. So, so uh, the old diagrams were very kind of uh, primitive looking. There were boxes and uh, lots of uh, arrows connecting them. And, uh, kind of looked a little bit like spaghetti uh, connecting a bunch of square meatballs. Um, what we've tried to do here is to combine those into something that's easier to understand, to use icons, uh, so that people could kind of at a, at a glance understand better uh, what's in here. Some of the color coding does uh, matter, the kind of yellowish mustard color is uh, means that those are actually from a different service area but connect to this so that people can go to that service area and, and, and see how that works. Uh, and, and then the arrows in between <coughs> just indicate what information passes uh, back and forth within this particular service area. The architecture use and maintenance is, is made up of, of uh, three sections. One section just talks about the architecture, what it is. Uh, then there's a section that gets into the use of the architecture. That includes how it is integrated with the congestion management process. And then there are four kind of uses of the ar architecture. One for planning, one for programming or program development, uh, whatever you want to call that. Uh, as you get a, a project funded, and then project development. So that's the first step after the project has been uh, funded to get the preliminary engineering started and, and those sorts of things, and then design. Uh, 
And then there's a section on how to update and maintain the architecture. <coughs> so we've completed the, the workshop. We got some good feedback. Uh, we've gotten good feedback from the uh, actual architecture document itself. Uh, some good comments that, that uh, uh, there'll be some more that come in uh, within about two weeks. Then we will complete both the architecture and uh, the use and maintenance uh, guide, the draft of that. Uh, we'll get comments back on the guide, finalize it, conduct the workshop. There are some outreach materials that will be provided. Those outreach materials are actually to help uh, uh, people who are in the planning process understand how this, this works. It's to be uh, kind of materials that might go out with other uh, planning materials. And we anticipate that the project will be complete uh, early summer. Did I mention you still have some interviews? We do. We do. Uh, and, and what's uh, We've got another project going on at the same time to update the statewide architecture. So there are a number of people who we would need to interview for both projects. And instead of bothering them twice, we are combining them into a single interview. We just have to, uh, the, the statewide project started much later than the regional one, and so we, we're just kind of waiting for it to catch up. And it should be, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that those interval interviews will get started this month and they'll be done next month. So that's, that's really uh, what I wanted to bring up. I did want to make sure we had some time for questions to see if you wanted to go into any more detail, if you had any interest in further discussions. I didn't want to uh, bog you down into the detail unless you actually want to get there. We should probably let the technical advisory committee know that we will be bringing it back to them for review and recommendation for approval to the policy committee. Cor so, uh, correct. And, and we, have, we haven't really planned a workshop with you all, but Les did say that he could be a delivery for a health conference with you. And uh, Ms. Walsh was at the workshop yesterday, which, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot to, to to go through and to understand and understand who's using it and why they would use it. But if you're going to approve it, you're going to want some help, I think. Um, Does that make me the new expert on the TAC? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I'll be going on and you can that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, be, uh, we're, we're planning to present that at, for approval uh, in April. Other questions? Uh, and just for the benefit of the other committee members, that you know, the additional interviews to me were important because the railroad, especially being down where we are, you know, interact with the railroads and crossings and how they figure into this architecture. You know, and that's one piece that's still not there. Okay. Thank you. Um, we are going to be posting documents to the rails too, and if you all are interested in seeing that, that's a good place to. Yeah, please, yeah, when they do, we well, can send an email. Yeah. Okay, I think next on our agenda, thank you, is um, the Hillside Intersection Study of Results and Recommendations, uh, Kim Jackson. With, um, uh, he's the project manager for DOT on this time. Yeah, and, and also with me here is Jeannie. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> God, I'm going brain dead. Jeannie uh, works with Kenny Engineering, and she authored the study for us. It's, uh, it's a reconnaissance engineering study. We looked at nine unsignalized intersections in town. This map kind of gives you a, a layout of them all. Elmore at Coventry, Elmore at 84. Those two are so close, we looked at them together. Abbott Road at Birch, Huffman at Pintail, Huffman at Elmore, Old Seward Highway at Dearman, Old Seward Southbound, Seward Highway Off-Ramp, Dearman at Elmore, and Rabbit Creek at Golden View. The criteria for the study was based on national triggers, side street volumes of about 1,350 or more vehicles per day with 5,400 on the main road. Uh, safety triggers were one or more severe crashes in a five-year period or five or more angle turning crashes in any one-year period. 
The study methodology consisted of identifying concerns, constraints, solutions, and doing a cost benefit to um, rank the projects against each other. The first, uh, like I said, we looked at Elmore at Coventry and Elmore at 84th together. Um, the concerns here are heavy volume on Elmore Road and uh, a lot of side street pedestrian delay. And uh, this is the preferred alternative for Elmore at 84th. It's a, it's a traffic signal with a uh, raised median there. And um, the preferred alternative at Elmore and Coventry is um, raised medians with pedestrian refuge and uh, turns. Also included in this is uh, reducing the grade north of Coventry to improve site distance. The next intersection we looked at was Avenue Birch. This was a preferred alternative. This, everything to the west was incorporated into the, or is being incorporated into the Abbott Road project. I think you guys got a presentation from that last month, so I won't waste your time with that. Huffman at Cange. Um, the concerns here are there's a um, pattern of angle crashes, although it's the, it's not, the crash rate is not above average, but there's a lot of congestion associated with um, the Grace Christian School. The preferred alternative is a roundabout, and uh, the next one that, due to the proximity of these, we're recommending that they be done in conjunction with each other. Huffman, um, the, the crash rate on Huffman at Elmore, that rate is above the, um, the average, with drivers 16 to 18 uh, overly represented at fault. Um, uh, preferred alternative there is a, a roundabout as well. Old well, Seward so at Diarman. Uh, the concerns here were limited sight distance for Diarman. There's a pattern of angle crashes, crash rates below the average, um, no operational concerns. Um, but when it was all said and done, uh, the recommendation was for no no build. Uh, there's lower than average crash rates, and all of the solutions looked at had an extremely low benefit cost ratio. I think we'll just be uh, Scott's going to be looking at that intersection. Uh, as time goes on to see if any problems develop. Next one is Old Seward at Southbound Highway, uh, Old Seward Highway at the Seward Highway Southbound off-ramp. Uh, the concerns here are traffic is backing up on the uh, off-ramp about half, about 500 feet. Um, and this is the preferred alternative. It's a median acceleration lane. The next one is Diarman at Elmore. And that one, it's a uh, higher than average crash rate. Um, with drivers 16 to 18 over represented, uh, surprisingly. And uh, in the AM peak, uh, the queues back up all the way from the South Anchorage High School all the way to the intersection. Um, when it's all said and done, uh, the recommendation for this intersection is no build. The problem is, uh, well, we're recommending a study of the South Anchorage High School entrance. That problem has to get fixed. The, the problem is traffic is backing up from that intersection all the way to this one. That brings us to the last one, Rabbit Creek at Golden View. Um, this one has a higher than average uh, crash rate and congestion in the AA <coughs> associated with the commuters and, and then the uh, people going to the school. The preferred alternative here is a, is a roundabout um, with it relocated to the south to reduce the grade uh, coming into the roundabout from the east leg of Rabbit Creek. Um, that reduces the grade uh, at the roundabout to about, I think, 2% from, you know, it's 10, 10 and a half coming down the hill there. Um, we recognize that it's problematic to stop coming downhill, but, uh, you know, that's going to make an improvement once they come to the uh, roundabout, and uh, drivers are just going to have to, you know, learn to modify their behavior as they come to it. Also, it should be noted that as development occurs, uh, the main movement is going to be from the west Rabbit Creek leg to the south uh, Ocean View leg, which those two movements don't really conflict in the roundabout. These are the department's recommendations. Uh, Rabbit Creek ranked number one, and then Huffman at Elmore with Huffman at Pintail, uh, number two. Abbott at Birch is, gonna, is being incorporated into the Abbott Road project, and then Elmore at 84th and Elmore at Coventry is the final one we're recommending. That one has a low benefit cost ratio, but um, there's really high volumes on there, and it's uh, sooner or later a signal's going to have to go in there, and so um, we thought it would be good to recommend it.
going forward, the study's complete. I'm going to close out the reconnaissance engineering study project and wait for funding to be identified. So is there any questions? Okay. Uh, I, I, can you back up to that slide that gives the cost estimates? Sure. Okay, this is something that the technical committee would will be faced with dealing with because um, unless, I guess that's a question, are these HSIP eligible? We're or looking into that, but it's, that's not going to be known until probably December. Okay. Cost-benefit-wise, cost they don't currently pencil out in comp competition with the other HSIP projects currently in the queue. So Scott, so Scott does think that not. Elmore at, or no, Huffman at Elmore, that's, that it's one might. It's close. But they're two years booked out yep. in the program. So. Yeah, so this is a, an important consideration for the committee because when you look at AMAX's allocation uh, from the STIP, from the statewide TIP, is, is only about $24 million a year, and we have some major projects. You know, we have Abbott and the way they have now, and we have a lot coming up. Um, these are pretty pricey. Um, and fairly low benefit cost ratio, too. Yeah, and yet these are problem areas that will continue to be problem areas until and unless. AMATS has a way of funding them. And thank you. Any other questions or observations? I'm always looking at the money. <laughs> Occupational hazards. Thank you. You bet. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Okay. Next on the agenda was a quick update on the cert review. Understanding you sent a whole bunch of stuff in. Uh, yeah, we did. We got a 25 page uh, questionnaire and we ended up sending it with uh, attachments, etc. documents around that. So, as for any additional requests for information, the main thing I wanted to point out is we have the public meeting for the certification review on March 3rd, from 5 to, I think it's actually 5 to 6 30. Uh, it's in the mayor's conference room. and. We have to add in the paper very soon. We've noticed it in several different uh, ways. And that's an opportunity for the public to show up. Of course, any other any this members. This is for the server review? Server review. They're always at the public meeting. So when is the, when is the point of the fence? They will be up here the second and the third. Okay. And then, uh, okay. Or is that the third, fourth? Third, fourth, sorry. Third, fourth, which is the okay. Tuesday, Wednesday. And then we have the TAC meeting where we're bumping a week early due to the spring break, so we'll have the TAC meeting on the fifth. I've let them know, I'm not sure whether or not their tickets have already given them a chance to stay for the TAC meeting. Thank you. That's where we're at. Okay, and I, I see I just missed a really important one, which is the payments uh, 2014 fourth quarter odd report. And for the committee, I'm not sure if anybody, um, if everybody's aware of it, uh, James Wilds uh, our AMATS. and trying to balance out and reflect the year, something that AMATS does that the state does not do through its stiff typically. Um, and so it's a little bit of kind of it, 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 it's matching up the program, you know, the, the, the TIP presentation for the program with what really happened. It kind of makes sense, but it all seems like a little difficult. So I think Aaron's done a good job here. Go ahead. Wayne, thank you. I'm Aaron Yumi Nalen. I'm the Anchorage Area Planner for DOT. Um, so we're looking at the fourth quarter uh, obligation report, and it's the final one for the 2011 through 2014 TIP. May. So I want to direct your attention to the very top of the front page. Uh, it's the box that's outlined in red and has the shading underneath. Uh, these are the total amounts, and I kind of walk through them really quickly. As Jennifer said, the AMATS allocation is 24.9 million uh, per year, uh, federal fiscal year, by the way. Um, and then for this op report, we did uh, 26.2 uh, funds were obligated slash deobligated. Uh, they kind of go hand in hand. And then we have uh, 8.6 million advanced construct. And those are two things I want to point out for you. Uh, a little lower in the page, the first one that I want to uh, talk about is the O'Malley Road reconstruction. It received 4.2 million 
uh, in advanced construct funds from FY15. And the second one is uh, the pavement replacement program. 4.4 million was advanced construct from 15. Now those two advanced construct items will have to be addressed in the uh, first quarter obligation report for 2015. That'll be the kind of foundation that we go on and how we're gonna deal with those. So that brings the total amount uh, obligated, deobligated plus advanced construct to $34.9 million for FFY14. Those are really the major ones for the AMATS allocation itself. Does anyone have any questions on that? Yes, Mr. Flynn always asks about that. So what is this really And that means we will have to adjust 15 to cover the advanced construct funds that we show here on this obligation report. I'm excited to try it. Fortunately, we're at the time delivery program. Yeah. So there is another piece I do want to point out to you just kind of uh, to show everybody how good this year was. Page number four, this is the portion that's outside the AMATS allocation, but still is money that is spent within the AMATS MOK area. And it is the National Highway System, Table 6. If you go down to number 10, it's the Anchorage Area Principal Arterial Pavement Resurfing and ADA Compliance. We said that we were going to obligate $20.7 million, $20 million. We actually were able to obligate $30.6 million for FFY14. So I just want to show you that a lot of work is being done, and it is awesome that we were able to get that done. So. And all of that money is coming into Anchorage for yes. improvements to existing facilities that are outside of the AMATS allocation? Yes. I would not have been able to fund prior to that Would not have been. And to the innovation of uh, Mr. Martin here, who is, I think, subversively, it is really a plan. <laughs> we won't tell anyone. That, that was tight words. That, well, truly, it is a program. <laughs> this, this program, the principal arterial, anybody who drives around, it's like, man, what is happening in Minnesota? What's happening? Uh, the, the bigger DOT roads that we haven't been able to fund, but by identifying, um, and since a lot of these roads, uh, C Street and some others have been. Uh, since our principal arterials are now eligible for NHS or NHPP funds outside of the NHS allocation. And so we have been, and I think next summer is going to be just as. Don't drive downtown. Yes, good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Erin. Any Thank you, Erin. Any questions? I have a question. What's the random little symbol on the right? I mean, that I see that it's a back in the the list. Ara was back in 2008 when I started the state, actually, it came through. So. That's just kind of signalizing which ones were connected to ARA itself or funded through ARA. Had some funding applied to it through ARA, completely funded. For the American Recovery Restoration, Restoration Act. Act. Yeah. Okay, I just didn't know that was Chef's choice. That was all. <laughs> Is there anything else? Close enough. All okay, right, thank you. Okay. Um, so everybody just recognizing that it is 420 and we have is we what? This item E. Okay, so in a, uh, last time I believe uh, there was a request for nothing to be in during the mass schedule. Um, and we have and I have uh, just a, a question too. Are all of the staff members represented here? Because it looks like perhaps they're not. Um, but I guess I'll let you go for it. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, some of the tasks, well, the, the trails plan is not in here, and I did ask Mr. Lyon about that, and he said he thought you all just wanted projects that directly related to the MTP. So this is not everything, everything that we're doing. For, and the Spinard Road Corner is, study is not on here. Um, so we thought this was an integrated task schedule just for the MTP, things that have bearing on the MTP. Okay, they do have bearing on the MTP, but it's also recognizing um, the importance of the, uh, the activities associated with the MTP is understanding where um, the other resources were being allocated. Well, it's not a complete UPWP task account. <coughs> That's not what this is. If, you know, if you would like something like that, we could work on something like that. Yeah, this is the most critical task. So, okay. Okay, go ahead. 
And it wasn't to that we were not trying to honor our other people. Okay. Well, um, there is something odd about this software I discovered today, and that is if you if you see it electronically, which we can send it to you, um, you can see it all the way out to 2016, but you have to scroll to the right. It's odd. You can't see the whole the whole timeline at one time. I think it's just a an oddity of the way it's set up. But it came <coughs> out to the end of 2016. The, the, the main things that we already know are that the travel demand model update has taken about six months longer than was originally projected. But that's okay because we're doing the interim MTP now. And we don't really need that information until March of 20, 2016. Um, if you look at line, line 63. And uh, the critical thing now is that we do the, get the interim MTP done by the end of this year. And, and we've been working with DOT staff, I've been working with DOT staff, and Jamie Acton has sit in on a few sessions for the financial plan. Our goal is to get you um, a memo for the um, inflation factors, the um, assumptions for revenue assumptions at the next TSE meeting to ask you to approve that. And we are going to try to get that to you and get enough time to advance it, enough time to digest it. And um, so the goal now is to have a public review draft by June 1st. We'll still have to go to the planning and planning commission because it has adopted as an elevated comprehensive plan. <laughs> so that um, is a long process. So we'll just have to <coughs> get with it. But that's what's buying us time with the, with the 2040 MTP. And it's a good thing because, because the model update was was delayed, and so we're not going to be in any, tr in any trouble there. If we have to do any modeling for the interim NTP, as you all put in your resolution, we'll just use the 2025 model. So if we have to. was done, and you, you know that, I mean, that was a big thing last year. It was approved by the assembly, adopted by the assembly, um, and I had it on here when I took it off, um, in June. And Joni will have worked on that. Offered it, and we have been asked now to manage a small procurement contract to get a consultant on to help to pull the document together, and we'll start working on that. Um, that um, looking at the schedule, and I think um, we may be able to refine that our the, the scope of services, uh, because based on the fiscal constraints analysis, we'll have a pretty good idea of whether or not any additional modeling is, if additional modeling is done, is, is required. I'm not sure what the schedule and. It would be uh, it would have an effect on the cost as well as the, the scope of the effort for consultants. So, um, but I think everything is flexible enough. To it does concern me though that we are looking at the very very end, and yet we will do it with can to accelerate it. Because this this is a critical path. This the in, the interim TP. I, and I guess I just put it out there and ask the staff, do you have adequate staff resources dedicated to the separate internal? Because if there are, if there's a need for additional staff resources to take away from other efforts that are not reflected here, then I, uh, especially since I'm down to one body and I'm going to be using part of another to dedicate to the separate. And so I, um, I, I guess I look to assurance that the municipality has adequate staff resources. Um, and if not, to do what you need to do to do that. When, when, when we had you folks recommend approval for the UPWP, it was you know, dedicating as much time as possible to their most important tasks. This clearly is the most important task. So although, for example, you don't see Joan's hours listed on here or her initials anywhere, she'll be helping out with every aspect of all of these. Just like we're all basically all hands on deck for it. So. Well, I've spent a lot of time learning with 
learning the financial plan. Thank, frankly, that is that is huge. It's 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 like huge. There are like 31 um, subsheets in this Excel spreadsheet, and Aaron was as hard has been doing some hand holding here. But we have neither one of us was involved in in going and getting the data to put into the spreadsheet, as as I understand, right? I mean, he's brilliant with with the spreadsheet and and. Entering the stuff and understanding it, understanding where it all it's really the, uh, the path, the, the learning curve is pretty <coughs> steep. And he let me know, I did not realize it, but he said, You're going to be spending all your time on the financial plan. You're not going to have time to write it, which scared, <laughs> actually scared me because I was planning to write it. And, and it, actually, that is part of my concern because there has been a lot of resources, and yet, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, if Vivian is the only one who's been at all of these meetings and very uh, seldom our other staff there. Well, Jamie, there. Jamie has been there a couple, a couple, a couple of times. But, uh, well, and Teresa's been real. Teresa's been real. Teresa's been real. Teresa's been I'm confident that, I mean, I'm starting, to, it's starting to come together. It's, it's really, I am getting it. It's just, um, and we want to document it too. That's another thing. For the next time we do this, we want to document the process for, for doing this. Yes. Yeah, that's important. And okay. you still have as, as resources, and we have parents with that, and to myself and um, Lance, you know, some of the resources on the Facebook And we're working with the Kindergarten Crossing folks, too, to get their, that uh, mm -hmm. piece updated. And they they were magnanimous. They're updating most of that information. Madam Chair, I remind you it's 4.30 and oh, we're, sorry, we're, we're done. At the end. Okay. Thank Unless you. we want to extend it. No. Thank you for the reminder. Any other questions? Okay. Any other comments? Thanks.